Hello and welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about my latest reading updates. Uh, I think it's been about two weeks since my last one. Um, very busy weekend last weekend. Uh, here it's Memorial Day weekend in the U.S., and it's a very rainy Sunday here in Connecticut, and uh, that actually gave me a little bit of recording time. Um, still a few more weeks before I'm on summer vacation uh, from teaching, so uh, once that happens, I'll be able to catch up with some videos, especially some tags that are backlog. I have a very long backlog of tags that I still intend to get to, um, when totally plan to. Um, <clears throat> so for what I finished, uh, I only finished one book in the meantime, um, and that's What Dreams May Come. By Richard Matheson, originally published in 1978. Uh, I had read already a uh, I Am Legend and The Shrinking Man by Richard Matheson. I, I really like both of those. Those are both written in the 50s. This one was published in 1978. Um, I chose this for uh, one of my maybe midrash reads, uh, where you know during during the month of maybe midrash you. Uh, choose books to um, discuss the topic of religion in uh, hopefully an intelligent way, uh, or at least a thoughtful way, which takes the subject seriously. And I chose this. Um, one, I mean, I like Matheson. And two, it's a very odd book. Uh, when I posted my Maybe Midrash TBR video, I believe uh, Michael K. Vaughn commented uh, about this book, saying that was a weird book. Um, yeah, it is. It, it's, it's a weird book. Um, and the, the reason I say that, um, first of all, you can see the, uh, the cover is from the movie that came out in the late nineties with Robin Williams in it. Um, and I, I did rewatch the movie, uh, just last night. Um, and it had been over 20 years since I'd seen it and I still do like it. Uh, I still, I think it's a pretty good movie actually. And I do think it's a good adaptation of this book and dare I say better than the book. I didn't hate this book, but it does have some weird qualities to it, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So why choose it for maybe Midrash? Well, it's it's not typical for a novel to have an introduction uh, by the author, but this one does. And I'll skip to the second paragraph. He says, uh, For this novel, however, I feel that a brief prologue is called for, because its subject is survival after death. It is essential that you realize, before reading the story, that only one aspect of it is fictional the characters and their relationships. With few exceptions, every other detail is derived exclusively from research. So he's passing this, you know, what it was, of course, what is a fictional book, off um, as still giving truthful accounts of the afterlife. Uh, a bold statement, certainly. And this tells a story of uh, Chris Nielsen. He's a, a, a script writer for television. And he passes away, uh, leaves behind his wife and four children. He lingers for a while uh, on the, <laughs> you know, the, the material plane, um, has an encounter with a medium. Uh, in fact, the, the framing device of this is um, that uh, Chris, uh, Chris McNeil has, uh, no, sorry, not McNeil, uh, Chris Nielsen. <laughs> Chris Nielsen has um, been recounting his his story of the afterlife to a medium uh, who then delivers that account to, I believe it was Chris's brother. And so we're reading the account that's given to the brother. So after he lingers on earth for a while, he finally does go into the afterlife and he experiences a, a heaven, which is largely created by his thoughts. And he finds that there are rules, uh, rules to heaven and other people and people can encounter. Um, and said so he leaves behind his uh, four children and his wife and his minor spoiler I'm not going to give away everything necessarily uh, his wife um, commits suicide and she is unable to join him in what is ostensibly heaven uh, so he decides to journey into hell to get her uh, I don't really want to go into too much after that um of course, there are, you know, you can already tell there's going to be echoes of Dante, echoes of the story of Orpheus. Um, those are all certainly in there. Um, he does a good job, Matheson does, of 
um, putting us into Chris's perspective uh, when he's when he's first realizing that he's dead uh, and he's kind of traveling around uh, the earth still inside his his, his kind of plane of existence. Um, he sees things very foggily, uh, and Mathen does, actually does a very good job of capturing that perspective. When he goes to the afterlife, things get a little bit odd <laughs> um, when he's in heaven. Sometimes uh, it definitely reads like um, Matheson is quoting from the very extensive, well, not super extensive, but extensive enough for a novel, um, bibliography that he has at the end of this book. And, you know, there's quite an interesting uh, list of books here. Uh, life in the Unseen World, more about life in the world unseen. Um, you even got a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The New Revelation, uh, which is kind of his defense of like spiritualism, I believe, from 1918. Uh, you know, Men in White Apparel, Unfinished Symphonies. Uh, a lot of, you know, Tibetan Book of the Dead is in here. Um, a lot of, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what I call it. Uh, I don't know if it's quite New Age, certainly some occult stuff, a lot of uh, things uh, showing a fascination with uh, psychic phenomenon. Um, certainly not the type of not type of books that you would generally find in a reputable academic bibliography, right? Uh, let's, let's just kind of put it that way. Um, that's his extensive research. Uh, certainly some questionable choices within that bibliography. And sometimes when he's hearing the rules of heaven, uh, it does sound like it's kind of just being quoted from. Um, reminds me of in Beetlejuice, uh, when they're reading, I think it's the handbook for the recently deceased. Um, they talk about it reads like stereo instructions. That's sometimes what it feels like. And uh, those parts can get very, very dry. Um, although there, there are some curious things about that, that whole section. Uh, this is at a time, from what I've read, that Matheson was trying to distance himself from horror. Um, that's what he's mostly known for even still today, right? Horror. Um, and he was very good at what he did when he wrote horror. Uh, but he's trying to break his way, break away from that um, during this time. It was published in 1978. And um, there's an interesting quote in here uh, where Chris, I said he was a, a TV scriptwriter, um, he goes into uh, the, his guide um, in the Afterlife Albert's uh, library. And he sees bound his scripts bound up inside this library. And he thinks that, you know, he never thought to have his own scripts bound up in his lifetime. But then he's looking at the titles, and there's a very interesting interesting uh, exchange here. Uh, he says, To my surprise, I saw a line of bound scripts on one of the shelves and recognized the titles as my own. My reaction came in layers. Surprise first, as I've said, then pleasure at seeing them in Albert's home. Then disappointment that I'd never had my own scripts bound while I was on Earth. My last reaction, reaction was one of shame, as I realized how many of the scripts dealt with subjects, either violent or horrific. I'm sorry, Albert said. I didn't mean to disturb you. It's not your fault, I told him. I'm the one who wrote them. You'll have lots of time to write other things now, he reassured me. Kindness, I know, kept him from saying better things. And... You know, I, I don't like to get into the habit of psychologically analyzing um, writers <laughs> through their work. I can't help but wonder, if, is that how Matheson was thinking of his career so far? Um, that he was writing low dreck, almost, uh, ashamed of the horror that he had written? Um, I'm sure, I, yeah, I think there's quotes that I've read about him that said, I never really wrote horror, what I wrote was more terror. I'm not splitting hairs here over that. Um, we, we certainly consider him a horror author today. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, it makes me wonder if, if that's how he was feeling. Like, he wasn't adding anything of worth um, in frightening people. And as somebody who who is a horror fan um, and who finds value in horror and who thinks that horror is actually culturally useful <laughs> and deserves more respect, um, I do find that very sad. Uh <laughs> You know, if, if that's kind of where Matheson's head was. Um, there's an irony here that he's moving away from horror, but honestly, the best parts of this book are when he's going through hell. And we see basically a mini, mini sections of horror. Uh, that's when the story picks up, and that's when the story comes alive, and that's where his writing is strongest in this. Um, 
you know, I just also read another quick passage. Feeling that wave as it seared and sickened me, I looked around and saw a knot of people standing about 10 yards from us, illuminated by a lurid, dirty-looking orange glow. Some had sneering grins on their faces, others expressions of savage, hate, savage hatred. It was a wave of their thoughts. Suddenly I cried out, stunned, the sound of it unheard beneath the lunatic din. The buzzing I heard, heard was that of flies, millions of them. Everyone was covered with cl shifting clumps of flies. Faces moved with them. They were settled in the corners of eyes and crawling blackly in and out of mouths. A ghastly vision filled my mind. Kit in a bearded, in a barbed wire uh, cut on her face. A solid pack of flies collected on it like a lump of living coal. Those in the bottom gorging on her blood. Their bellies red and swollen with it. Even when I waved my hand at them, cried out in revulsion, those flies hadn't stirred. I mean, this is... I think it's enough to give you an impression of some of the things he's seeing in hell. Um, but that's, that section is more alive. <laughs> I mean, I know we're talking about the afterlife and death, uh, than many of the other things that are in this book. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting in that way to me, certainly. Um, you know, his depiction of the afterlife, uh, is oddly rule, rule oriented. <laughs> Um, I think that the movie does a good job of simplifying things and um, ironing them out, uh, making it very much more just about thoughts and how we can't escape our own thoughts, you know, or, you know, we can be freed by our thoughts or we can be trapped by them. Um, that's kind of the difference between heaven and hell. Um, this goes into a lot of other weird mumbo jumbo uh, as far as like the rules and pseudoscience and uh, what they're able to do, what they're not able to do, why they're able to do it, uh, the different... Um, different jobs that people have in the rules. It, it just, it gets a little bit too, um, too bogged down in the details, I think, that um, the story kind of grinds to a halt sometimes uh, when he's just kind of being taught all these things by people in the afterlife. Um, but, you know, especially when he goes through hell, I really did like that part. Um, and his wife, Anne, uh, who he loves and who he's driven to go get, um, she is depicted, and this is 1978, but it feels like 1958 the way that Anne is discussed. Uh, she is kind of depicted in Chris's own words as like a girl child. I think at one point he's even holding her and he's talking about this child woman. Uh, and he kind of sees her more, I mean, yeah, I mean, she's sexually attractive, but she's more like somebody he has to take care of. Uh, and somebody who he sees is almost kind of like one of his children, uh, in that way. And there's that kind of patriarchal caregiver way. Uh, and when, when he's when he's trying to reach her in hell, he's at one point thanking her, and he has this long list of things he's thanking her for. And it's a lot of things like thanks for all the meals you cook. I mean, it's it's all the things. Thanks for all these services that you provided for me. Uh, some of it sounds like <clears throat> you know you could just take it out and you could put it on a an advertisement in Life magazine in the 1950s. You know, it's like you know, darling, for all the all the socks you darned and all the meals you cooked and putting up with all my fussing. Here's your new vacuum. You know, it, it's it kind of comes across like that in certain ways um so you know and even this deals with reincarnation and uh he and Anne are soulmates um but we always see her in a supporting role you know we don't see her kind of doing her own thing and him supporting her it's always like how amazingly supportive she is of all the things he's trying to do uh so yeah it, it's it's kind of very backward looking in that way which i'm surprised about um so anyway uh those are my thoughts okay what dreams may come um, I, it was okay. <laughs> like Michael K. Vaughn said, it's weird. Um, you know, did, did I love the book? No, I, I do actually think the movie improves on things quite a bit. Uh, the movie takes the best parts of this and runs with it and, um, smooths out the rough, rougher edges. Like I said, um, you know, it's, it's not a bad book. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a weird one. Uh, in addition, um, I did also finish, uh, the Dark Knight Returns, uh, which um, Steve Donahue and Matthew over at Mayberry Book Club uh, were doing a read-along for in the month of March. And um, yeah, th this this is my first time reading it the whole way through, I think, maybe. I think I read it in the in the 90s, but I didn't really remember much about it. And um, I can't, I'm not going to say much, I can't add much to what the videos that they had posted about it. But yeah, this is, this is a, a pretty good story, but it's not a good Batman story. It's not really a good Superman story. Um, the artwork is good, but... Yeah, Batman is just, you know, he, he just kind of flies at the seat of his pants, doesn't really plan ahead very well. 
even when he does plan ahead, you don't really understand his rationale. Um, and he just seems sloppy and lucky uh, most of the time. But I understand why it was so um, controversial. Not controversial, sorry. Influential. Um, I can definitely get that. And I'm glad I read it. But, uh, yeah, it's not the best Batman story, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> even though it's often advertised that way. Um, and in the meantime, I have been reading some other books. Uh, I'm about halfway through um, William Peter Blatty's Legion, his sequel to The Exorcist, and I I was surprised that I'm finding similar situations with Matheson uh, when it sounds like um, in uh, What Dreams May Come, he's just kind of quoting from his bibliography. <laughs> um, it feels like that a little bit with Legion in the first half. Uh, we have just these long digressions into uh you know uh, apologetics the proof of god and uh even some intelligent design which is very weird um so i uh, i'm hoping the book is going to pick up in the second half because i can't say i'm having the best time with it so far um and you know i do really like the exorcist uh and the other thing i've been reading that i'm almost done with is a uh, village atheists um how american unbelievers made their way in a godly nation and this is a uh, from Princeton University Press, um, a history of American unbelief uh, in late 19th century America, uh, which I said I'm almost done with, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm probably going to end up making a separate video on this. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's been my reading for the past two weeks. Uh, a book done, graphic novel done, and uh, almost done with uh, two other books. Um, so, hope everybody enjoys the long weekend, um, and I'm going to hopefully maybe get another video in today uh, before I call it a day. Uh, but anyway, thank you, Booktube.